I'm Susan Withnell. My business is Useful Fiber Arts, and I am a hand spinner, creating hand spun yarns, and I also have hand woven items that I create on my looms. Today, I want to welcome you to my farm, and I normally would be demonstrating at Waterford with my spinning wheel. However, you'll notice a couple of differences today since I'm at my farm. First of all, normally at Waterford, I have a great big Angora rabbit in a cage next to me. Well, I thought I'd do something different today since I'm not at, at the Waterford and I'm at the farm. I thought today I could have a new spinning partner. This is Rachel. Rachel is one of my ewes. She is a high percentage Wensleydale sheep. Wensleydale fleece are a rare breed British sheep. And I'm fortunate that I have some genetics in my lines now that a lot of my sheep are now 80% or better Wensleydale with my best sheep being about 95% Wensleydale. This is a castle wheel. A castle wheel is an upright wheel. So it has the drive wheel underneath the flyer head. Normally people see storybook pictures with a big round drive wheel and the flyer head is off to the side. That's an East, a Western European wheel. Those are called Saxony wheels. This is more of an Eastern European design. However, uh, both of them operate the same way with the, the treadles attached to the drive wheel. So let's start with the operation. Up at the top I have a flyer head. The flyer head goes around and the bobbin is what's going to collect the yarn. The flyer head is attached to a drive band. The drive band goes down around the large drive wheel. Now you can see drive wheels of all different sizes. This is a, a pretty standard average size drive wheel. The drive wheel is then connected with the footman to the treadles. Down here, the treadles are what keeps everything going. So when I'm using the spinning wheel, my feet are the power that is going into this to create all the movement and all the motion that's necessary to, to make the yarn. I'm going to start treadling and explain what's happening here. The wheel can go clockwise or counterclockwise. I'm going to start it clockwise, and you can see the drive band up here on the whirl. The whirl is making the flyer head go around. Now there would be yarn going in through here and attached to the bobbin. We'll see that in just a minute. The spinning wheel, as you see it here with, with this type of mechanism, it has been in use for about 500 years. Um, slight changes to it. This is a modern wheel. It was made in Canada by a man named Gord Lendrum and I was able to, to purchase it from him. So we're going to ne next go and see how we start with raw fleece perhaps taken from Rachel with her beautiful curls or from one of her flock mates and go from raw fleece to finished yarn. Okay, let's start with a fleece that has just been taken off the sheep. The sheep obviously live outside in a field. I do not coat or cover my sheep to keep the fleeces clean, so that's very, very labor intensive and rather expensive process. But the fleece does come dirty. Rachel has been uh, showered yesterday, so she looks pretty good, but her flock mates are pretty dirty, and that's typically what would come off. So I have here a sample of what the Wensleydale locks look like straight off the sheep. You can see the lock structure, you can see the length of it, and although Wensleydale is known for having a luster, because of the dirt it's a little bit hard to see the luster, but you may be able to get a, a bit of an idea that there's a little bit of shine to that. When I say luster I mean shine. Now this fleece is going to be washed in very hot water with a lot of soap, and a lot of dirt is going to come off of it. So that when I'm finished, I should have pretty much white, white locks. I have to be very careful because fleece wants to mat. It wants to felt. And felting is not good for the spinning process because felting means that all of the fibers have stuck together. So when they're being washed, everything has to be very, very gentle. No rubbing, no excess squeezing, no wringing. Everything is done with padding and, and gentle squeezes. 
So now I have some clean locks. Normally with a fleece this long, I would not use hand cards. I would use something called wool combs. I don't have wool combs, um, and I am gonna show you on hand cards because it can be done on hand cards. These are my hand cards. The hand cards look like a dog brush, like what you might buy at a pet store. They have lots and lots of tines on them. There's a slight curve to them. And what I'm going to do is I'm going to put the fleece directly onto the hand cards. And what the hand cards are going to do for us, the hand cards are going to open up the locks and they're going to get basically everything going in the same direction. So now that I've got them put on, I'm going to go top to bottom and I'm going to put them together and lift up as I pull off the other card. So this is a process that takes two or three passes to go through. I turn it over and I start again. I turn it over and I start again. And because this is a long fleece, it's a little more difficult to do with hand cards. Uh, wool combs would be better, but it's certainly doing a fine enough job. I think one more pass should do it. And I've managed to get most of the fleece onto this and off of this card. What I need to do now, you can see it's all opened up light and fluffy. There's a little bit still together. I could work on that a little bit more later. But this is opened up and ready to spin. The fibers have been separated. I'm going to roll down and make a cylinder out of my wool. Now that I have a cylinder made of, of the wool that I've carded, I'm ready to do my spinning. So this is the wool that we just carded, came off the carding combs, and it's all ready to be spun into yarn. Now I have to make an admission. I deal with about 60 pounds of raw wool a year. Washing and carding the wool is not the fun part, and it's extremely time consuming. So what I do is I send my fleeces right from the sheep off to a woolen mill, and the woolen mill has massive vats to wash it, and enormous 12 foot long rolling drum carders to card it. And I get it back looking like this. This is called roving. And it's the same thing, the wool has been carded. This would be actually long, it would continue on for many, many um, yards. And this is the same thing as this. It's just that this would take me forever. And this gets it ready for me and I am ready to sit down and spin. So I'm gonna go ahead and start spinning. And what I've already done is, I have some yarn attached to the bobbin. From the bobbin, it comes out through here on the flyer head, it goes through this called an orifice, and it comes out here ready to go. Now, of course, I don't wanna tie a knot. I don't wanna have knots in my yarn to connect it. So what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take advantage of the two things that are gonna hold this into yarn. Before it's twisted, it just pulls straight apart. It takes nothing, nothing to get it apart. But there are two things that are gonna help it hold together. One is the twist. Once there is twist in this, it doesn't wanna come apart. And the other thing is, if you were to look at this under a microscope, each fiber would have microscopic scales sticking out up the whole length of the fiber. And those scales, when the twist is put in, also are going to grab hold of each other. It's those scales that also cause felting, which is why I have to treat this very gently because I don't want felting when I'm using spinning wool. So I'm going to lay this fuzzy part next to this fuzzy part, and I'm going to build up a little twist. The wheel is going clockwise. I always want to spin clockwise. Now I'm just letting the twist go in and pull the, the wool and now I've joined, you really can't see where I joined, and it's going in. The wheel is pulling it on, the wheel is also putting the twist in it. That's the wheel's job. My job is to determine how thick or thin I want it to be. I could spin very thick yarn, or 
if I put very little bit of fiber into the twist, I can spin sewing thread. Now this is gonna be very thin, I hope you can see it. But even though this is that thin, because of the twist and because of the scales, that is a strong yarn. That's only about three fibers twisted together. And that is a strong, strong yarn. Another nice thing about using Wensleydale, the fibers are very long, so there's a lot of length in the twist. Now this isn't really what I'm spinning for. Generally what I spin for would be something that would give me a yarn that is approximately a DK or sport weight. So I'm just gonna continue letting this go on. And as it pulls in, it's filling up the bobbin. Sometimes I get a little bump, but that just gives my yarn some character. I do try to even things out. There's, there are some types of yarn, art yarns that are lumpy and bumpy. And if that's what you're going for, then you make lumpy, bumpy yarn. Now what I've done is a single. A single is not finished yarn. A single has all this twist in it, and if we were to try to use it, it would be all twisting up on us. And that's not good for, for use for knitting or weaving or crocheting. But in order to finish the yarn, I'm going to have to take two singles and ply them together. Now I can show you here that two singles plied together would end up looking like that, and that's my finished yarn. But I certainly need more than eight inches of finished yarn. So in the next section, we're going to talk about what I do to ply two singles together to make my finished yarn. Well, we're back now, and I spun a little bit more yarn into that single that I had started showing you a few minutes ago, so that that bobbin had just a little bit more on it. And now I'm ready to start plying. Remember I said plying is when we're taking two singles and twisting them back together. In this case, they're gonna be twisted together in the opposite direction. So plying means that my wheel has got to be turning counterclockwise. Remember the single was going clockwise, so for plying counterclockwise, will help balance out that twist. I've put the two bobbins that have um, the singles on them down here on a, a piece of equipment called a Lazy Kate. I like to imagine that the person who decided to call these things Lazy Kates was somebody whose daughter, Kate, was supposed to be holding the bobbins on some knitting needles while they were plying. And Kate decided she didn't want to do it. She, she was too lazy. And so either she or somebody in her family invented something to hold the bobbins and said, well, that's our lazy Kate. But this truly is called a lazy Kate. We have the two bobbins. They're coming, the single is coming through up here. I've got both in my hand. And now I've got some yarn that I'm going to attach it to, to pull onto this new bobbin. Now this new bobbin has a little bit of yarn that I've already plied, but um, it does have to be a new bobbin because now the bobbin's gonna be spinning in the opposite direction. In order to attach, again, I don't want to knot, so I'm just going to fold the two and fold the yarn, and now we're gonna take advantage of that twist. I've got to get the wheel going counterclockwise, and it's starting to twist, and I'm going to encourage it to twist into the folded yarn, now I'm going to encourage it to twist into where I folded the yarn over, the singles over. And now again, the wheel is pulling and pulling the yarn onto the bobbin. It's also putting the twist in it. Now if I put a whole lot of twist, and beginner spinners, this is something they often do. If I put a whole lot of twist, my yarn ends up really kinky and, and messed up. So actually I'm going to have to get past that spot here to show you then how I can do it the right way. So let me get past that bad spot. Now if I put the right amount of twist in, then when I hold my yarn down, it won't twist up. The yarn has balanced the singles against each other, against their twist, and now I have balanced yarn that is my finished yarn. Clock counterclockwise, and I'm going to go on. Now while I finish plying, I want to tell you a little bit about Rachel. I said Rachel was our special sheep because Rachel was the first sheep born three and a half years ago on my farm to my high percentage Wensleydale ram and my high percentage Wensleydale ewe. Before she was six months old, she had two very, very serious diseases. 
uh, one of which required a blood transfusion to recover from. The other required that she live in a room in the basement in order to have pretty much round the clock care for about two weeks. She recovered from both of those. And then just about the time she turned six months old, a uh, dog uh, at the fence line, outside the fence, was harassing her. She got scared, she jumped up, her leg got hung up in the fence, she broke her leg, rear leg, in a very bad place. Rachel, most places would have been put down, but because she was such a special girl to me, um, I got in touch with the New Bolton Veterinary Center, which is the University of Pennsylvania Veterinary Clinic, and one of their orthopedic surgeons actually put her leg back together with pins and screws, and we spent four months rehabilitating her from that, that surgery so that she would be able to survive and be a member of the flock. She got through it. She has been wonderful since. She's a very special young lady and has gone on now to give us absolutely beautiful lambs and um, help increase my, my Wensleydale flock. So I have finished plying. I'm just going to break off and show you what the plied yarn looks like. And it's got the twist in it that is, has made it such that it's not going to get all, all uh, jumbled together. Now, once this bobbin was full of plied yarn, and that would be about four ounces of yarn, which I sell yarn in four ounce skeins. Once this bobbin is full, then I take it off. Now I could do it on my, on my uh, elbow and I could just wind it this way, but there's actually a tool with another fun name called a nitty knotty. And a nitty knotty is what I would do the, the unwinding on. And that would give me my skeins of yarn that, that are then finished and ready for the next step. This is beautiful white yarn. White's nice. I've made some white things myself. But white's not the only color in the world, so next I'm going to show you a few different ways that I can dye my yarn to get different types of dyed yarn. Hi, I'm back to show you a few different dye techniques, and I guess, uh, I guess my friend Star is going to help. You want to model the yarn? Well, that's the difference between clean and dirty. <laughs> This is alpaca yarn, so obviously just a white skein. It's very, very soft. Alpaca is, is very soft fiber. But if I take just a white skein and I want a single colored yarn, then what I can do is I can dip it into a dye pot. Now I get a great big pot, and this is, is the Wensleydale that uh, was white, obviously, and I dyed it in a peacock dye. And you can see the sheen on it if you look real carefully. Um, the sun's shining on it a bit, and it gives a little little luster, little life to it. Uh, I can do about six to eight skeins at a time. This is alpaca, which has been done um, in a purple dye pot. This is how my skeins are sold, is, is um, spun up and twisted like this. But this is the, the way they would go into the dye pot. Now sometimes we just use natural fibers and blend them and this has been a blend of silk and baby camel down. Baby camel down is um, truly the the soft under fiber that comes off uh, when a baby camel sheds out first and the silk is the white and they were blended together as roving. Now this is natural colors but it's spun all together and it's a heathered look. If I want, well the girls have decided that they're coming over to graze over here. If I want a colored heather look, Star, what are you doing? Tasha, there's Tasha. Tasha is a, a blue face lester. Uh, she and Star here are blue face lesters. They're the oldest sheep in my flock. And I um, originally had blue face lester, another luster long wool sheep, but I'm going more towards Wensleydale now. But to get a colored heathered look, the roving is dyed and then blended. So this would have been yellow roving, green, uh, orange roving, and, oh, hi, Rachel, uh, and um, rust roving and brown roving. And then that's all carded together, either commercially or, or on hand cards, to blend it so that what I end up with is a heathered look. This one here is Starry Night. 
and the blue and the aqua and the um, yellow and uh, different shades of blue and also some sparkly Angelina fiber were all blended together and then spun together. Same technique was used to, to create um, the heathered moors. This, these are both wool and mohair fibers, so the wool fibers and mohair fibers, they were dyed and then they were carded and blended together. One more way that, that uh, dye can, can influence your yarn is if I take just little pieces of individual color, and this is a bag of four ounces that I've put together in order to have um, blocks, individual blocks of color, a little bit here, a little bit there, and it's just, just fun. It's, there's there's a, lot, a lot of times no rhyme or reason. When the single is spun on the bobbin, you can see that there are sections of blue, sections of green, sections of orange, there's some sections of aqua, um, sections of yellow. Then the singles are plied together, and in this case, a yellow section may ply together with, with a red, I mean an orange section or a green section. And that creates a totally unique yarn that has no rhyme, no reason, nor consistency to it. This one was done where I pulled specifically blue and rose and aqua and purple colors to try and stay in that colorway. And you can see that as it twists, it creates this barber pole effect, but you never know along the length of the yarn what two colors are gonna to twist together to make the barber pole. So it's a totally unique yarn situation and another way to, to get colored yarns. Really, really rather been at the water for fair, interacting with real people, not just a camera. But in lieu of that, I'm glad I was able to do this, and hopefully you've enjoyed learning about hand spinning wool. I'm here with my special girl, Rachel, and I will tell you, to be truthful, Rachel had a little spa treatment today. She, she got a shower this morning because obviously she lives in the field and she was she was pretty dirty but over here I have most of the rest of my flock and if you look over in the corner happily grazing away we have the rest of the girls one of these is Rachel's son from this year Let's see if we got to move him over this is Rachel's son looks spitting image of him I do have one black sheep Tasha there's Tasha, Star, Jacob, Mist, the alpaca. I am down to just one alpaca right now. We've got Nellie and Sandy, and in the back, I have Faith. So from everybody here, oh, and also over in the uh, ram field, I have two boys, one, one neutered male to keep my intact ram company, company. That's John and Ted. So from everybody here at, at my farm, especially Rachel, who's our, our wonder girl, we thank you for watching all of my products, woven and, and um, uh, hand spun yarns are available on my Etsy page. And I believe that has been showing. If you go to Etsy, look for useful fiber arts and you should find my things. Thanks for watching.